Hello everyone. Uh, today, uh, the second uh, lesson of the quarter, 2020, uh, third quarter. Uh, but before we uh, uh, begin with a discussion, I'd like to uh, apologize. I said something last uh, week or, or last Sabbath that uh, I, about Cornelius uh, being a leper. Uh, no, 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 I, I misspoke in the, and so uh, uh, I'm sorry for that one. Uh, so, uh, uh, you know, sometimes uh, I have so much things in my mind that, you know, uh, things uh, go hayward uh, in our discussion. Anyway, uh, uh, our lesson this morning is uh, win some witness, the power of personal testimony. Uh, third quarter, uh, lesson number two, for July 4, July 10. And uh, so before we begin, I'd like to uh, uh, offer a word of prayer. Dear Lord, this uh, morning, uh, we are here, Lord, to discuss a very important uh, subject uh, about witnessing. May it be that uh, as we open your word and uh, learn something out of these tidbits of uh, uh, you know, discussions and, and suggestions, meet the Lord that you guide us into the truth. Give us the encouragement and the inspiration to really understand what it is. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, uh, okay. Uh, so our lesson, win some witness, the power of personal testimony. And so, uh, lesson number two. And so, uh, we are going to discuss uh, uh, the unlikely witness on Sunday, uh, proclaiming the risen uh, Savior, uh, risen Christ. And then uh, we are going to talk about uh, the uh, changed lives makes a difference. And then sharing our experience and then the power of personal testimony. And then we are going to summarize our discussion uh, a little bit after that. So, uh, in our discussion this morning, uh, uh, the, our lesson says that uh, there is a difference in value between sharing what Jesus has done for someone else and sharing what Jesus has done for you personally. And so what is the unique value of a personal testimony of what God has done for you? And uh, we're going to talk, what are the dangers in such approach? Uh, how can the sharing of personal details in your life enhance or detract from picture of God? So, uh, to begin, everybody has natural barrier on personal persuasion. Persuasion, I mean. Why? Because God has provided that natural barrier to maintain stability. Anytime approach someone to witness, and when the natural barrier is raised, it makes witnessing less useful. So what is your personal, what God has done for you in your life that makes your testimony effective? In a powerful way, personal testimony is not only some testimony, but must be uh, the most powerful testimony. And so there are dangers in focusing witnesses on personal testimony, one of the dangers is it works for me, so it should be also working for you. And it becomes my story. You see, look uh, how far I have come. And then personal testimony uh, is a window of what has done, what God has done, but sometimes we often tell it often enough, it becomes our story. And there is a risk also of rendering judgment. A witness can only say, this is what I saw, and does not judge. Only the judge of the court render judgment. But sometimes in our testimony, we judge. We judge when people disagree with us. So, uh, you know, sometimes uh, those are the risks uh, that we encounter or, or maybe personally encounter uh, in, in sharing our personal testimony. So uh, this morning, we're going to talk about what is personal testimony. 
And it is to share what Jesus has done in our lives and how he has transformed us with others. And uh, transform us with others. It is to tell others about God's amazing grace and how grateful we are for his salvation. It is to speak of how Jesus loves us and how we love him. So uh, uh, this morning, we are going to talk about our quarterly subjects, uh, Testimonies of Possessed Man and a Likely Witness. We are going to talk about in details about uh, you know, the, the, what's uh, happening in there. And then we are going to talk about Testimony of Mary, uh, the Boundless Joy, uh, in our lesson titled. And then we are going to talk about uh, Testimony of Peter and John, uh, you know, they were not silenced uh, and in details. And then, uh, of course, we are going to talk about the testimony of Paul, uh, his daily conversion, a powerful personal testimony. So, uh, in uh, Unlikely Witness, <clears throat> if you notice, uh, when we read the Mark 5, 5 uh, 15 to 20, uh, I, I took this from the New International Version version. Uh, when they came to Jesus, they saw the man who had been possessed by legions of demons, sitting there dressed and in, his, in his right mind, and they were afraid. Those who had seen it told people that what had happened to the demons possessed man and told about the pigs as well. And then the people began to plead with Jesus to leave the region. As Jesus was getting into the boat, the man who had been demon-possessed begged to go with him. And Jesus did not let him, but said, Go home to your own people and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. So the man went away and began to tell all, uh, to tell in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him. And all the people were amazed. So, why do you think, you know, uh, in he, why do you think Jesus sent the man in the capolis to witness his, for his family, friends, and rather keeping him? So, the capolis was a group of ten cities close to the Sea of Galilee. They shared Greek or Roman culture, not Jewish. And so, uh, and then, of course, uh, uh, when Jesus arrived, only a violent, possessed man welcomed him. Jesus released him from the demons that were tormenting him. And then uh, the man was restored physically, mentally, and emotionally. So, uh, <coughs> so uh, he, he wanted to stay with Jesus. However, Jesus chose him to be the first missionary, his mission was a simple one, to tell others what Jesus had done for him. Thanks to his testimony, a great crowd gathered to listen to Jesus some months later, as said in Mark chapter 8, verse 1 to 10. So, when they came to Jesus, on our Sunday's lesson, uh, they saw the man who had been possessed, and those who had seen the people so. Why do you think when the Sabbath was over, uh, no, okay, let me uh, go back here. I think I made the, uh, a question. So the man uh, went away and began to tell the Decapolis how much Jesus uh, uh, has meant to him. So the idea, the first missionary, see, the first missionary According to our slide, he was the first missionary that Jesus sent. Uh, uh, Jesus chose him to be the first missionary. His mission was simple one, to tell others of who Jesus is. So now, transformed by his grace, this unlikely witness had a powerful impact in the capolis. Ten towns, mainly to the east of Sea of Galilee, the demoniac had been hopelessly possessed with a demon for years. He terrorized the region and struck fear in the hearts of villagers living in the area. Yet deep down in his heart, there was longing for something better, longing that the demons could not quench. Despite the demonic forces that held this poor man 
in bandage. Mark 5 records that when the demoniac saw Jesus, he ran worship him. And then the scripture says that this man was tormented and possessed a legion of demons. A legion was the largest single unit in the Roman army. And false strength consisted of about 6,000 soldiers. According to the archaeologists in, in, in the New Testament, the term legion represents a vast or huge number. Jesus never lost a battle with demoniac forces, no matter how many there were. Christ is all-powerful, victorious Lord. Demons are no contest for his mighty power. Jesus' ministry is always complete. Once the demoniac was delivered, he was found sitting and clothed in his right mind. Where did he get the clothes? It is likely the disciples shared their outer garments with him. He now sat attentively at the feet of Jesus, listening to his words, eagerly absorbing spiritual truth. He was physically mentally and emotionally, spiritually whole. This one desire was to follow Jesus. He longed to become one of Jesus' disciples. Mark's gospel records that the former demon-possessed man begged Jesus to allow him to enter the boat and journey with him. And the word beg is a strong word. It indicates passionate desire. It can be translated beseech or implored or entreated. It means make an appeal with emotion. It means to ask with intensity. Jesus' response is as equally amazing as the demoniac conversion. This Jesus knew that this converted, transformed demoniac could, know, could do more in that region than he and his disciples could do. The prejudice was high in this gentle region against Christ. But they would listen to the one of their own, especially, you know, one with reputation like the Nibuniaks. And eventually, they would be prepared for Christ's visit at a later date. Therefore, Jesus said in here, choose him to be the first missionary. Go home to your friends, he said in Mark 5.19, and tell them what great things the Lord has done for you, and now he has compassion on you. The man's response was immediate. And he departed and began to proclaim in Decapolis all that Jesus had done for him. And all marveled. The word proclaim is keroso and can be translated to herald or to publish. And in the brief time that was the demoniac spent with Jesus, his life was so radically changed that he had a story to tell. We can only imagine the impact of his testimony. Had on the thousands of ten thousand, the ten towns in the Gadara region. When Jesus returned some nine or ten months later, the minds of his large legentile population were wide open to receive him. So there are moments there are moments that is more powerful than education. Jesus sent him home because he has something to tell of what happened to him. The transformation was credible. Credibility is very important in personal testimony. Again, credibility is important in personal testimony. To witness of who Jesus was so powerful through a transformed life. In his story, people were afraid of the demoniac. After he was healed, they preferred the demoniac than Jesus. And so, see, one thing amazing about the story of this demoniac was that after they heard Jesus heal the demoniac, they want Jesus to go away. You know, that's why uh, uh, there's a saying in the Bible that the prophet has no honor in his own village. So this is what happened to Jesus Christ here. Thanks to his testimony, a great crowd gathered to listen to Jesus some months later in Mark 
chapter 8, verses 1 to 10. In our Sunday's lesson, I mean Monday's lesson, proclaiming the risen Christ, I'm going to read, uh, read uh, Mark 16, 1 to 11, here on the, uh, uh, on the screen. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of Jesus, and Salome, both spices so that they might go to the to Anuen Jesus' body. Very early in the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb. And they, and they asked each other, who will roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb? But when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in white robes, staring on the right side as they were alarmed. Don't be alarmed, he said. You are looking for Jesus, the, Na the Nazarene, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not he. See the place where they laid him? But go tell his disciples and Peter. He is going ahead of you into Galilee. There will you see him, just as he told you. Trembling and bewildered, the woman went out and fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. When Jesus rose early on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had driven seven demons. She went and told those who had been with him and who were mourning and weeping when they heard that Jesus was alive that she had seen him, they did not believe. So if you notice here, uh, the, 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 the risen Savior, what was Mary's response when she discovered Christ was risen from the dead? And when was the last time you were rebuffed in your witness? When did you respond? How did you respond? And what have you learned from that experience? So if you notice that, uh, Mary's witness was rebuffed by the disciples. Uh, he was, on Monday's study, proclaiming the risen Christ, proclaiming the risen Christ is one of the issues that uh, when she went and told those who had been with him as demon and wept. See, when Jesus was crucified, the disciples was depressed were depressed. They, they, you know, they, they were looking for... And then on, on Resurrection Sunday, Mary traded grief for happiness, weeping for joy, despair for hope. And meeting Jesus that they filled her excitement, she couldn't help but run and tell everyone the good news. And we should also run and share our experience after meeting Jesus because good news is worth sharing. However... No one believe here. Don't expect everyone to believe our words immediately. They all believe eventually. So on that Monday's study, proclaiming the risen Christ, the two Marys are transformed at the tomb. The last time they had seen Jesus, his bloody body was taken down from the cross. Think of their despair at the moment. The last few days, they were difficult beyond belief now with faithful hearts, anxious about the future, they approach the tomb, wondering how they will get past the Roman guards and who will roll away the stone for them to enter the tomb and embalm the body of Christ. To their surprise, the tomb was empty. Christ is alive. An angelic being announces he is risen. Go quickly and tell the disciples. And, and, and it, Mark says, he added, Go the disciples and Peter. The record says that so they went out quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to bring the disciples' word. As they were running to tell the story of our resurrected Lord, meets them and exclaimed, Rejoice! Go and tell my brethren to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. Good news is, you know, for sharing. Hearts filled with his grace and charmed by his love cannot be silent. And did you notice that Mark says that, I think Peter just, you know, cherished this. In Mark 16, 
What did the angels add to Jesus' statement? Go and tell the disciples that the Lord has risen and will meet them tonight. And what does Mark add say? Tell Peter. Right. In Mark 16. What do you think of the treatment of Mary with her reputation and Peter with his performance the last 24 hours and Jesus' treatment of Mary and his treatment of Peter is really a revelation of truth about God. The repeated theme throughout the New Testament is one of witness. The acts of the apostles are acts of witness. The disciples witnessed of a Christ they knew, one of whom they personally experienced. Is it possible to be a false witness? Let's suppose that you were called to court of law and the witness of some accident of crime. Let's also assume you were not present in the scene and made up the story to assist a friend. You could be imprisoned for lying to the court. The judge and the jury require only witness with personal experience of events. They want genuine witnesses, not imposters. So the disciples were, Mary here was a genuine witness when he sees an empty tomb. And uh, however, uh, you know, no, nobody believes. As uh, our screen said, not, you know, the, not, don't expect everyone to believe our words immediately. But however, so uh, let's to go to the experience of Peter and John. Uh, when we read Acts chapter verses chapter four verses one to twenty, uh, the question is, what happened when the authorities tried to silence Peter and John? What was the response? What relationship there between knowing Christ and sharing Christ? And so, uh, how do you put the themes of this lesson together with our emphasis on the picture of God? What was the key event? that transformed the apostles and their witness? Why did the event make such a big difference in their way of speaking and witnessing? So the theme of this uh, lesson in a Tuesday is about Jesus, the resurrection, and, and resurrection. What was about the resurrection that was so powerful? It was the evidence that Jesus said, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. He was real. God wants to communicate of who he is. When Jesus was raised from the dead, that was it, the living revelation of God. The testimony of the disciples was coherent of what everyone knows in Jerusalem. They could not be silenced when authorities tried to silence them. And the evidence that these things were true was evident that the disciples' boldness. For the disciples, the boldness itself was the witness. The special circumstances was driving it, and that was the resurrected Christ. It provides evidence that they were, what they were saying was true. Part of the context was that they were accused of stealing the body. That is why there was an empty tomb. They could have, you know, just disappeared and avoid arrest. But no, the disciples were upfront in proclaiming that Jesus had risen and not stolen. The New Testament believers shared Christ they knew. Peter and John echoed the reality of converted hearts when they proclaimed. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen. And, heard. and before the cross, Peter was a vacillating yet self-assured disciple. The crucifixion and resurrection of Christ changed his life. Before the cross, John was one of the sons of thunder. That's not the title that you give to a meek, mild, timid man. But after crucifixion, the resurrection of Christ John's life was changed. Neither Peter nor John could be silent. They were transformed by grace and love to tell the story. So uh, in, in order for us to 
really digests the point in which Peter and John testified the story to the to the Sanhedrin. It's because uh, they have a changed life. Witness is very important. It says neither Peter nor John could be silent. They were transformed by grace and love to tell the story. And then so <clears throat> sharing in our daily conversion, sharing our experience. I talk about Paul's experience here now. Uh, I have been crucified, he said, with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in flesh, I live by the faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave me himself for me. So, witness in Paul's conversion is one of the most spectacular ones. His vision of resurrected Jesus triggered a radical change in his life. When he was confronted by Jesus on the way to Damascus and asked the question, Paul, Paul, Saul, I mean, he was Saul before Paul. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And so it was spectacular once. His vision of resurrected Jesus triggered a radical change in his life. He saw Jesus himself right there, confronted on the way to Damascus. And when sharing his testimony, he didn't talk about the one-time change in his life. He explained that God was still working in his life. His conversion was renewed daily. He said, I die daily in 1 Corinthians 15, 31. And of course, witnessing is not about us, but about God. It is to share his forgiveness of sins, his daily blessings, his inexhaustible grace, his everlasting love. And so uh, uh, witness is not about us right here, but uh, how bad we were or even how good we are now after we have met Jesus. It is all about Jesus. It is about his love, his grace, his mercy, his pardon, his eternal power to save us. The Apostle Paul never tired of, terif, of testifying of what Christ did for him. But he never focused exclusively on how bad he was. Instead, he focused on how good God is. And so that's, I've been saying all along that, you know, our testimony is not about us, but it's about God, how good God is to us. And so, if you look at uh, the idea in here that, uh, see, Paul was, remember, he was a persecutor. I mean, uh, persecu persecuting uh, uh, the early Christian church. And so when, you know, confronted by Jesus on the way to Damascus, he was a changed man. Now, the power of personal testimony is very important to Paul because uh, <clears throat> he was brought uh, to Herod Agrippa, uh, you know, and then Herod Agrippa was raised in Rome under protection of Emperor Claudius. And he was given a small kingdom of Calcis and was commanded to supervise the temple of Jerusalem. He showed the people that he followed the Jewish tradition because he was claiming to be a Jew. And so Agrippa now he is a Roman officer, I mean, yeah, a Roman official uh, with a Jewish background. And Paul, in his testimony in his court, uh, Paul showed great kindness to his skeptical governor. He thanked Agrippa for giving him the chance to share his personal testimony. And then, of course, Paul's speech was interrupted, so he made a personal call to Agrippa, do you believe? That was his question after a personal testimony. And then, of course, Agrippa said, uh, uh, what God, say, then Agrippa said to Paul, 
you almost persuade me to become a Christian. What God has done in our lives because a strong impact in others, we can show them that accepting Jesus and being redeemed is like, and we can lead them to surrender uh, uh, to surrender to Him. So, uh, look at the change uh, at the change in Paul's before and after Damascus, an incredible change in the man. He totally reversed his methods because he changed his picture of God. It is encouraging to see. Uh, it is the one testimony of a final generation that will give. You know, uh, that's one of the understandings of the mission of the church in the end. It's not only that we survive the time of trouble. It is not only that we bear witness to others and we have the privilege of doing what Job did and saying to God what is right. But we should actually add confirmation of what God has said. I am able to heal people who trust me. By showing a generation of people who had been wonderfully healed, it doesn't win the great controversy for him. But it just adds further confirmation of truthfulness of his statement. There is no condition I cannot heal. I can take a person in the worst possible condition. If at least healthy, please help me. You know, and trust you enough to listen. He took Manasseh after all those years of being such a wicked king. And apparently after all those years of being such a wicked king, transform him. And I doubt that Peter was an easy job, had an easy job. And Paul was probably much harder. But he did change these people and we have an additional privilege then of adding confirmation that we have a very good physician. Our privilege to explain to the world the truth about God is the use of his power, and that's great good news. When he confronted Paul on the way to Damascus, he did not probably, you know, shock Paul uh, in there and ask a question. Paul, what are you doing? You know, that those kind of questions can change us, you know, because God could have just snapped him out there, you know, you are persecuting my people. But he asked a personal question. What are you doing to me? Why are you persecuting me? And you know, that changed his perspective in a way in which Paul realized who Jesus is. That Jesus, in spite of what he has done, persecuting the church during that time, Jesus was still interested about him. And in Paul's testimony to Kang Agrippa, was very personal and very credible, personal in a way that it changed, you know, uh, you know the testimony, a, a personal testimony about a changed life is more powerful than being a very, very good speaker, a very, you know, people who are good in, 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 in convincing people. You know, and that's a great news because those who live in fear and uh, the value is nothing higher than the, the freedom of dignity of individuality in his intelligent creatures that their love, their faith, their willingness to listen and obey may be freely given. Such things are not just produced by force or might or power, but only by persuasiveness of the truth. And so God says, not by might nor by power. I have infinite amount of both but I cannot get what I want the most. Something I've given my life to keep and preserve. I cannot get these days. Only the methods identified with the Holy Spirit of love, of truth, and of freedom is important. So, uh, uh, as I mentioned last week, that Paul wrote a advice to uh, Timothy that, uh, you know, do not be quarrelsome. 
but rather be loving. And in addition to this, when we do this kindness and loving kindness and, and in treating other people, in telling your personal testimony, it becomes more powerful than become a powerful speaker uh, in front of everybody. So uh, here this morning, uh, on the idea of a powerful testimony is that, what do you think Agrippa reacted the way he did? Because what impressed him about Paul's testimony? So if you notice, uh, Paul's testimony of how Jesus changed his life had a powerful impact on a godless king. There is no witness as effective as a changed life. The witness of life genuinely converted has an amazing influence on others. Even godless kings are moved by lives transformed by grace. Even if we don't have a dramatic story as Paul, we all should be able to tell others about what it means to know Jesus and to be redeemed by his blood. And so uh, uh, this morning, hopefully, we can gather some hint, an idea of how to uh, you know, testify uh, about who God is to other people. And so uh, the, the last uh, next two slides I have here is, in a matchless gift of his son, God encircled the whole world with an atmosphere of grace as real as the air which circulates around the globe. All who chose to breathe this life-giving atmosphere will live and grow up to the stature of men and women in Christ Jesus. And then the last, uh, next slide is, uh, all who have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come have work to do to those in their homes and among their neighbors. The gospel of salvation must be proclaimed to others. Every man who has felt the converting power of God becomes, in a sense, a missionary. There are friends to whom he can speak of the love of God. He can tell in the church what the Lord has done to him. Even in a personal Savior, the testimony given in simplicity may do more good than the most eloquent discourse. And so that was the last slides that we have. And hopefully, our discussion this morning, when some tis- witness personal, the power of personal testimony, the Savior's experience we have with him, and the picture we have about who God is, a loving, kind, gracious Savior, and uh, given in testimony, given in simplicity, may do more good than the most eloquent discourse. And uh, I hope that uh, we have, uh, you know, uh, we are here in our class uh, this morning, but, uh, you know, we are still in this situation that we cannot be. Uh, so practically, our discussion, I'd like, I missed that one, and uh, your questions. So uh, again, uh, if you have uh, questions, you can respond to me, uh, uh, sunikoj at aol.com, and ask a questions, and then uh, I'll try my best to respond to you. Anyway, uh, uh, let's close our discussion today with a prayer. The Lord this morning. Thank you so much for uh, the blessing of uh, this lesson, personal testimony about who you are. May it be, Lord, that uh, we will experience that in our own lives so that we can share it to others, like Mary, like John and Peter, like Paul, like, you know, uh, the possessed, uh, demoniac possessed man. Because you are so good to them. You are so good to us also. That we may not be able to hold this in our own, but share it with others. Lord, help us not to be cocky about this experience. And may it be that as we share this, 
testimony that uh, it will glorify your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.